Hey guys, welcome to week six. We're now in the second half of the term, and I just, I know I've said this before, but things are gonna move pretty quickly from here on out. Um, <clears throat> this is a time to really also kind of take stock of where you are. I know that it's particularly challenging to be learning under these conditions, not just the row conditions, but the structurelessness that comes with not actually having contact with <clears throat> your professors, with your classroom. Uh, I know that for me, you know, it's, it's very freeing to get to be able to do my lectures in my dining room whenever I want, but also it requires an act of will to, to, to do it. I experienced this just today. It was like, well, if, if it was school, I would just have to be in class at eight in the morning and at noon, and I would just have to be there. Um, now I was like, I have to actually get myself, not just set up, it's an easy setup, but just like mentally make myself go there. I understand that that, that challenge of kind of having to exert more will because there's less structure exists for a lot of you as well. And so <clears throat> I just want to know, just want to let you know that I understand that's a challenge and that this is a good time in the term to say, okay, are you, are you behind? What's coming up to really look at the calendar to, to, to try to introduce some structure into your life that in response to sort of how you saw the first half of the term going. So this is a good stock taking time and a good time to, to plan because the term will end very quickly and there's, you know, <clears throat> work consistently do throughout. So even if I give you some leeway on assignments because it's been hard, it's, it's just going to pile up. So pay attention to where you're at, what's coming, and uh, just know that I understand that it's a challenge. And so if, if you're having difficulties, I want you to reach out to me. All right, so it is day 53 on the self-quarantine count-up. That's a lot of days. I'm starting to feel like I can round that up to 100 days. Um, and I guess technically you can. But I don't want to dwell on that right now. I want to jump right in to the lecture and uh, talk about conservatism. Uh, <clears throat> today's, the title of today's lecture is The Conservative Response to Liberalism. And the reason I call it that is because, interestingly enough, conservatism doesn't really emerge until after liberalism is, it hasn't named yet, but it, until after liberal ideas begin to ha have themselves emerged and are beginning to become uh, uh, popular and start to kind of become a, a dominant set of ideas, conservatism is a reaction. But it's interesting because conservatism would seem like, it, well, it must be older because the fundamental tenets are like conserving the social order and looking towards tradition, and those things point a lot more towards the past. But in a way, the reason why conservatism doesn't actually have to form itself until liberalism has gotten some steam behind it is that uh, the world was essentially kind of a conservatively oriented place in terms of what conservatism starts to say about how things should be. And uh, th since there was no major challenge, no upheaval that was coming that would displace some of the, what are the central notions of conservative thinking, that uh, it didn't need to be formalized or formulated or written about in a particular way. And so it's, it's interesting that you know, the, the, the intellectual godfather of liberalism is John Locke, who was writing in the 1600s, and really the intellectual godfather of conservatism is Edmund Burke, who was writing about a century later uh, <clears throat> as these ideas that you know, when Locke gave birth to them didn't necessarily seem like they were going to become uh, central to the intellectual and political discourse of Europe or the, the North America, and they did. Uh, so conservatism is a, is, is a response to say, okay, well, well, what is it? We need to protect something from the creep of liberalism. We need to make sure that uh, what it is we think is valuable is not run roughshod over by liberalism. And so what are we? What is our thought? And that's, that's when conservatism begins to sort of uh, get formulated. Uh, conservatism is really also really not a political ideology so much as it's a disposition. It's a, it's a perspective. Uh, now, I've portrayed liberalism as, you know, a diverse family of ideas that, you know, there are some commonalities. And to, to call liberalism an ideology is a little too overdeterminate, but Liberalism really does present, in a way, if not a blueprint, at least a set of instructions for creating a blueprint. And different thinkers will draw out that blueprint quite differently. But there are some central precepts of liberal thought. The, you know, you're starting from the uh, individual, the, the, from individual sovereignty, from the rights holding sovereign individual. <clears throat> and asking the question of like, okay, uh, 
how can we like proceed in understanding what government's gonna be like, what our social relations are gonna be like, what the economy's gonna be like, when we are going to prioritize and privilege the uh, free choice of the sovereign individual. That is, if, if not a full-fledged ideology, or at least it doesn't give rise to just one version of it, there really is a, that central principle, the prioritizing of liberty above other values and the central place that the sovereign individual plays in our thinking about ourselves, about society, about the economy, about the political system, about the universe in general. That's what liberalism has. Conservatism doesn't really have a similar sort of principle or starting point. What conservative thought has is a set of family ideas. It's a you know it has, it's similar to liberalism in that way that there's it's a diverse and rambling family, but it's an even bigger and less coherent family. Uh, and what conservatism has is more uh, dispositions and outlooks. Uh, or uh, you know uh, traits of what we could call what, what we could call the conservative disposition or the conservative outlook, the conservative approach, the conservative perspective. It's probably better to refer to conservatism as an outlook or a disposition. And liberalism, uh, while it's it, as I said, it overdetermines it to call it an ideology. Liberalism really does have more of a traditional political philosophy that emanates from it. It starts with a set of principles about the place of the individual uh, in relation to society, the nature, uh, human nature, and uh, sort of systematically can build up on that thing. It doesn't mean there's not disagreement on how to interpret various of the important pillars of liberal thought, but there are kind of these pillars. Um, so all of the different conceptions or all the different uh, like family members had, had, you know, they had the family nose and the family chin. The conservative family less so has the nose and the chin, though there are definitely you know, like, oh, okay, I can see how you guys are in the same family. Now, I don't want to stretch this metaphor too far, and I sense that I probably already am doing so. Um, what I want to do today is explore what it is that this conservative disposition or conservative outlook is like, uh, <clears throat> and see what that tells us about how conservatism can be seen as a critique of liberalism. Uh, even if it doesn't offer a kind of separate model, a competing model, we're going to look at critics of liberalism that have a competing political model. And conservatives don't really have a competing political model. They have a set of things they think should be adhered to, yet it doesn't turn out that these build into a political philosophy at all. Um, so, and uh, so again, it's more of a disposition and an outlook. Though we can we can definitely glean some points where we can see, based on uh, the critiques of liberalism, what it is that conservatism stands for. I also want to point out that there's a, a, a lot of diversity among conservatives about what they think it should happen in the world. Essentially, policy uh, pr uh, preferences and perspectives and. This is actually a result of the fact that one of the key features of the conservative disposition is um, an adherence to and a kind of a prioritizing, possibly even a worshiping, well, that's pretty, putting it pretty strong for a lot of conservatives, but uh, an, an admiration for and a respect, deep respect for tradition. Um, that traditions represent time-tested social forms, time-tested pra human practices. And because they're time-tested and they're still around, they deserve a level of respect and admiration and adherence um, that liberals are actually not going to afford to traditions. Because if traditions tell us, here's a model of life, or they, you know, and that's what a lot of traditions do, they actually give us a model of life. They, they create all of those things that uh, liberals say we should be doing ourselves. The, the fundamental act of individual sovereignty, the first act, is to decide your conception of the good. Not your first act in terms of the, it's the first thing you do, but the, the foundational form of rationality for liberals is the ability to choose your own conception of the good and then to freely pursue it in whatever way your individual rationality tells you is going to be the best way that, that, that you can achieve that. Tradition is the opposite. Tradition says, here is a way of life. Here are a set of practices. Here is a conception of the good. Orient yourself around this. Um, so 
uh, it's pretty clear that tradition is going to present as a starting point, or at least I shouldn't say a starting point, because it's not the only starting point, but tradition as uh, something that's worthy of respect and admiration is definitely going to be problematic for liberals. And in fact, the power of traditions to frame our conceptions of the good and to uh, narrow our choices to a small set and possibly even to just one avenue is one of the problems that liberals had with the world as it existed and they'll still say is a problem with the world as it exists, um, that, that tradition truncates individual sovereignty. And so they're essentially, you know, I won't say deadly enemies, but they're definitely adversaries for sure. But tradition as a kind of a, a, a thing to be respected and admired and an important, uh, an important feature of the world means that conservatives are going to actually vary quite a lot in terms of what they want the world to look like because traditions vary so much from place to place. Um, and I would say that the more thoughtful conservatives, and the, the, the ones I've, I've uh, given you to read today uh, are among these more thoughtful ones, are going to acknowledge what is probably strange to a lot of people when they think of conservatives. They think of conservatives as narrow-minded people who, who want to impose their views on other people and don't mind uh, telling people how to live their lives. That may be true in a particular context, but the thoughtful conservatives who look sort of at conservatism as uh, across the full landscape and as a disposition as opposed to a set of policy preferences would acknowledge that an important part of the conservative disposition, if you're going to respect tradition, is that traditions vary from place to place. And what it means to respect tradition in one place asks for a set of actions that you can't translate that set of actions to a different time and place because that different time and place has different traditions. Um, and traditions do evolve and transform, and conservatives don't necessarily think that we need to set the world as it is in amber and, and, and solidify it and, and protect it against change. Um, tradition itself is recognized as a living thing, as, you know, in, in a sense, it's an organism. Um, that, but it's a slow developing organism, and that if traditional practices are those things that have survived because of, they've withstood the test of time, things things will transform as time proceeds. But conservatives are looking at tradition, and, and uh, that's why I think when I said worship, that was definitely too strong. Respect and admire traditional practices without actually then fetishizing them so it's like, well, it has to be exactly this way. But this reverence for, or admiration for tradition as an important uh, sort of uh, stabilizing force in human society, and I'll say more about this as we move along, means that conservatives will differ from each other on what it is they think should be done. Um, one of the probably the most banner familiar uh, phrases of conservative thought is traditional family values. And uh, American conservatives will tend to talk about traditional family values and why it's important to not only respect them, but to enact, enact policies that will protect traditional family values against the kind of modernist onslaught of materialistic, consumeristic, uh, relentlessly innovative, liberal society. <clears throat> what are those traditional family values? Well, American family values, the, traditional, the traditions of our families, are different from the traditional family values of other cultures. Uh, in a society that is more multi-generational and more uh, collectivist in its orientation, Traditional family values are going to look different. They're going to uh, be more oriented towards, say, respect for older uh, people, respect for older family members, a caring for uh, all the generations, and a deeper intertwining of people with each other at, at further removes of the family, cousins and second cousins, and at multiple generations, grandparents, great-grandparents, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, all, all the generations. In our, our, our traditional family is really more of a nuclear family. And even though the nuclear family is really kind of an invention of the mid-20th century, it, was, there was an, there, it built on an evolution of what was already, the American family was much more separate. It was less intergenerational. It was less uh, uh, sort of sprawling in the connections that people had. Uh, to members of their families uh, near and far. So if you're a 21st century American conservative and you respect traditional family values, that's going to look different than a 21st century uh, conservative in, say, uh, India, where traditional family values are a quite different thing um, 
<clears throat> and a big part of that is the multi-generational household. Con traditional uh, uh, conserv conservatives in America aren't worshiping or reverencing or admiring the multi-generational household because that's not part of our American tradition. Um, it, even back in the colonial times and in the 18th and 19th century, when it was more common for three generations to live together, that still wasn't necessarily the norm. Um, and what has been the norm in a very individualistically oriented uh, society such as ours, one with these kind of liberal roots, cultural liberal roots, is that um, striking out on your own and leaving your family and setting up your own situation and creating your own nuclear family is part of the American tradition. So when you have an individualistic culture, the traditional values of that culture are actually going to be different than when you have a more collectivist culture, when you have a culture that is younger like the American one is and, and uh, pride, you know, it sort of was built on mobility and innovation, uh, you're going to have a different set of traditional values that you're going to want to protect and adhere to than in an older uh, society that, pride, that, that, that values uh, mobility way less and that actually is, is more multi-generational in its orientation. So conservative thought, when it looks at the whole landscape of tradition, doesn't see a need to have a uniform uh, tradition. And in fact, I think one of the things that uh, is problematic about liberalism for conservatives, and I think this comes out pretty well in the reading, is this fear that liberalism is actually asking us, despite the accept liberals' acceptance of these multiple conceptions of the good, that liberalism is asking us to have this kind of cultural uniformity, where everywhere is a high level of respect for individual sovereignty, and everywhere we have forms of government and social uh, interaction that are centered around the individual and that uh, um, accept a kind of limited uh, government attitude and a, and a kind of an anti-authoritarian attitude and, a, and, a, and seeing society and the government as both an aid and a threat, conservatives can look at liberalism and say, well, even though you accept all this individual diversity, ultimately what you're looking for is this kind of monoculture, a liberal monoculture of uh, the, the main and only thing to be reverenced is the sovereign individual and we build everything else around that. Conservatives who step back from their specific milieu and say, well, these, this is our traditions that I want to conserve, who step back and look at what it is that conservatives are actually asking for, uh, will see like they're asking for a much more multicultural world. Um, and I think that that plays against type. And, I, and, and for sure, there are plenty of people who self-identify as conservatives and who hit a lot of the features of what I will talk about today makes a conservative, who aren't going around advocating for uh, multicultural uh, diversity. And that's because liberal multicultural diversity is different than conservative multicultural diversity. Conservatives are fine with different cultures and different traditions around the world and in different communities. What they want is each community to have its dominant culture be the, and its set of traditions uh, to be the ones that are dominant there instead of inviting in the diversity onto the inside. So globally, there's a multicultural diversity that comes out of conservative thought, but locally there will be a set of traditions that have grown up in this particular environment, right? And traditions, they're time-tested in a way they're much like the plants that have adapted to, or the, any of the uh, organisms that have adapted to a particular environment. Um, the traditions that grow up in a place like uh, North Africa are going to be different than grow up in a place like Southeast Asia, are going to be different than grow up in a, in a place like Central or Western Europe, are going to be different than grow up in a place like uh, North America. Because there's different environmental conditions, there's different resources, there's different histories to those places. Uh, different problems uh, presented themselves to the people in those different places. So the traditions that they developed that have survived the test of time were and are well adapted to different environments. And so conservatives are just saying, look, when a particular way of life that is dominant in a place among a group of people um, has survived and, and, and essentially it's changed maybe slowly, but it's survived the test of time, that's worthy of respect and reproduction and, and, and protection. It doesn't mean that we are going to say, well, our culture is the right one and our traditions are the one that everybody uh, should adhere to. That kind of muscular uh, 
conservatism does exist, for sure, and, there, and, and uh, in, in terms of foreign policy, that goes under the name of neoconservatism, where the idea is that America has the best right values, liberty, democracy, equality, capitalism, and what we're going to do is we're going to take those and put them out in the, in the, world, in the rest of the world because the rest of the world needs these, tr these values and these traditions that we developed that are the right ones. I definitely do not want to say that that's not a hallmark of certain kinds of conservative uh, thought. It's a more rambling family, the conservative family, than, than the liberal family. But the very notion of tradition plays a central role, and then, as you can see, it sort of it, it creates this problematic about, okay, if traditions are allowed to be different from place to place, and if traditions are allowed to grow and evolve in response to changing conditions, but we want to admire and reverence and protect traditions, that becomes a little like, well, okay, change can come. Conservatives aren't anti-change, but change needs to be slow. But how slow? And we acknowledge that traditions are time-tested because human practices have adapted to the environment, and it's those adaptations that are time-tested. So adaptation is important as well, but how much adaptation? Just saying, well, we don't want to freeze the culture and the traditions that we have in this moment and practice them forever, and just saying that we don't want to take what we have and generalize it to the rest of the world doesn't mean that there aren't tricky, important questions to answer. A big part of why tradition is so important to conservatives is because of what it does for human beings. And a big part of the conservative disposition is that it looks at liberalism and, in a way, sees it as this exhausting project of individual sovereignty and the exercise of rationality, like coming up with your own conception of the good, exploring it, changing it, having to figure out how to move your life in the direction of getting closer to your conception of the good, like that's exhausting. And also, why do it when there are cultural forms that are available to you? There are, there are ways of life, there are lifestyles, there are uh, values and conceptions of the good that are there for the taking and it's way less exhausting and risky and traumatic and problematic to follow these beaten paths, right? So it's basically, it's the, there are beaten paths. So why would you be an idiot and like go trying to machete your way through dense forest when there are beaten paths through the forest, which is a human life? Uh, so there, there is that sense of like, of it, it's, it's just easier. Um, I want to, I'm going to read a couple of uh, passages from the two readings today because I think that, uh, it's for, and I'll probably do this mode a lot in this part of the course, because I think that it's, these different ideas are easier to, to kind of explore when we anchor them in some particular things that authors have said. Okay, this is from the very first page, right side column, of uh, Michael Oakeshott's On Being Conservative. Um, and this is, I would say, it's a long paragraph, but uh, this, this does get at the conservative disposition. To be conservative is to prefer the familiar to the unknown, to prefer the tried to the untried, fact to mystery, the actual to the possible, the limited to the unbounded, the near to the distant, the sufficient to the superabundant, the convenient to the perfect, present laughter to utopian bliss. Familiar relationships and loyalties will, will be preferred to the allure of more profitable attachments. To acquire and to enlarge will be less important than to keep to cultivate and to enjoy. The grief of loss will be more acute than the excitement of novelty or promise. It is to be equal to one's own fortune, to live at the level of one's own means, to be content with the want of greater perfection, which belongs alike to oneself and one's circumstances. With some people, okay, that, that, that's as far as it goes. And that actually shows a, a contrast, and I think that what Oakshot is doing here is not only describing the conservative disposition, he's also describing the contrasting liberal disposition, right? Uh, liberals will prefer the unknown, the untried, uh, the possible, the unbounded, um, the uh, utopian bliss, um, uh, profitable attachments, uh, um, acquiring and enlarging as opposed to keeping and cultivating. The, that kind of restlessness that he's contrasting the conservative disposition with, it, while that's not necessarily how I think liberals would portray themselves, I do think that's a pretty decent characterization of what's behind the, or excuse me, not what's behind, but what uh, emanates from the uh, liberal privileging of liberty over all their values and of placing the sovereign individual at the center of all thinking. 
what is the sovereign individual going to be doing other than, you know, in this kind of restless way? Now, you might say, well, liberalism makes room for you to be conservative. If you, if you want to prefer the uh, familiar to the untried, go ahead. Um, but there is, an, there is kind of a critique of that sort of acceptance of the way things are in the notion that as an individual, to really be fully free, you aren't just making choices that come from your free will and that are unconstrained by other people. You are actually framing your own way of life by exploring the possibilities, considering the different conceptions of the good, and choosing and then maybe re-choosing and, and, and being in a state of not necessarily constant reevaluation, but constantly being able to reevaluate what your orientation is. And that essentially is a, that stirs the pot. And conservative, the conservative disposition is to say the pot doesn't need to be stirred. And by stirring it, even though people could say, well, hey, you know, I, I, I could explore, but then come back to my familiar, uh, is, is already to disrupt that particular uh, disposition. Uh, there is a sense of what human nature is to, uh, to the conservative view. And I'm going to read, this is from page three, right, right side of Oakshot. It is commonly believed that this conservative disposition is pretty deeply rooted in what is called human nature. Change is tiring, innovation calls for effort, and human beings, it is said, are more apt to be lazy than energetic. If they have found a not unsatisfactory way of getting along in the world, they are not disposed to go looking for trouble. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. I like that, a not unsatisfactory way. They are naturally apprehensive of the unknown and prefer safety to danger. They are reluctant innovators, and they accept change not because they like it, uh, but because it is inescapable. Change generates sadness rather than exhilaration. Heaven is the dream of a changeless, uh, of a changelessness no less than of, of a perfect world. Um, of course, those who read human nature in this way agree that this disposition does not stand alone. They merely contend that it is an exceedingly strong, perhaps the strongest of human propensities. So we do have other impulses besides this uh, version where we uh, find innovation and, uh, tiring and where we resist change. We do are allured by change. We do want things that are exhilarating rather than merely uh, satisfactory. But the claim here is that uh, much like liberals aren't saying that human beings are all rational, self-directed people, that those traits have to be cultivated and, they're, and they, are the, they are the better ones and so we ought to cultivate them. Conservatives are saying that humans' reluctance to change, our uh, aversity to risk, our uh, desire to be, or happiness at being, uh, having our desires sort of moderately satisfied rather than going for something that's fully exhilarating, that those are our stronger tendencies. And also, that there are better tendencies, that this is a good thing to cultivate. So both the liberal and conservative views are actually saying, okay, human nature is pretty diverse. We have all of these different tendencies and all of these different capacities, but one set of those capacities is more worth cultivating than uh, the other. And liberal and conservative set of traits that are seen to be desirable um, are in fact pretty much the opposite of each other. And I think that Oakshot does a really good job of drawing out what that contrast is. And um, part of what he's talking about, this disposition and the human nature, is a reason to be suspicious of the entire liberal project, which is to center the political view, the economic view, the social view, uh, the view you have of yourself, your self-identity around the sovereign individual who is essentially only really sovereign if a full self-invention, right? A full self-creation. Conservatives don't think that human beings need to or have really any business being this sort of fully self-inventing uh, creature, this sort of th this kind of being. Um, that's not who we are. That's not how we adapted. It's not how we've developed. It, we are uh, much more likely to be afraid of change than to embrace change. And liberalism then, and this is why conservatism is actually a response, liberalism is a dangerous promise. It's a destabilizing, risky, dangerous type of road to go down. Um, <clears throat> and dangerous in a lot, in a lot of ways, um, but you know, one of them is that liberalism can sweep aside age-old traditions and bring in an era of very tiring, exhausting, destabilizing, uh, constant change. Uh, and that, to conservatives, makes the world a worse place. So the world was going along just fine, to, from these thinkers' point of view, before liberalism came along to destabilize.
Now, what is it that more specifically, besides this kind of acceptance of the way things are and this reverence for, if not outright worship of, but at least reverence for and admiration of tradition, what is it that, that conservatives are pushing for? What do they really want us to accept? Um, this is in Russell Kirk, The Conservative Mind. This is on a, uh, page 8 to 9. And he says that he thinks there are six canons of conservative thought. And these are not principles in the sense that in order to be a conservative, you have to believe the truth of each of these things, and then we build on them all. These are more like, uh, canons are really more like predilections, dispositions. They're things that uh, will be hallmarks of your perspective. Number one. Belief in a transcendent order or body of natural law which rules society as well as conscience. Political problems at bottom are religious and moral problems. Now, one of the things about this is that much like the admiration for tradition, there's not a specific version of what the transcendent order is <clears throat> that conservatives will uh, accept or admire. There's just this notion that there is a transcendent order and we are part of that order, we come into the world enmeshed in that order, and we, sh we, instead of fighting against it and trying to remake ourselves and remake society, we should be respectful of uh, and admiring of that order uh, and acknowledge that that's, that's just, we're no different than any other beings. Every being, whether plant or animal, ha has a place in an ecosystem, in, an, in, 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 the, in the order. And Birds don't fight against their place, right? If you're just because you're prey to some other uh, stronger, faster, keener animal, doesn't mean that you have a right to, or even it's a good idea to try to like change that order, right? You don't get to remake the world so that the bird of prey, which which eats your eggs, uh, doesn't do that. And there's this just basic acceptance in nature that there's an order, and we all find our place in it. Human beings in this conservative view, need to accept that we are no different and than any other being, it, it, no different in the, in the sense that uh, I mean, we're different because we have different traits, just like a lion is different than uh, a zebra and an eagle is different than a sparrow. Um, we are different creatures because we have different traits, but that we're no different in the sense that we are enmeshed in a natural order. And kicking against that, it doesn't actually improve our lives. It actually just means that we are not accepting of the way things are. Number two, affection for the proliferating variety and mystery of human existence, as opposed to the narrowing uniformity, egalitarianism, and utilitarian aims of most radical systems. This is a, a, a kind of, I would say, awkward and a little confusing way of saying that there are multi, this is the multicultural traditional embrace. Like, there are all kinds of different forms. Um, we shouldn't try imposing some kind of blueprint. Now, I think that that's overdetermines what liberalism really is, that liberalism is not about this kind of uniform uh, uh, adherence to a specific set of principles. But, as I indicated earlier, there is a kind of a liberal monoculture where uh, the ind sovereign individual is at the center of all things and we're all politically equal, we're all uh, morally equal. Um, this principle says, no, you know, there are all kinds of ways of seeing what people are like. Now, if you're thinking, and maybe you are, and I hope you are, like, but if we're saying there's a transcendent order, and that also there's a proliferating variety uh, to human traditions and human uh, practices, doesn't that mean there isn't a transcendent order? That, you know, d why, if there were a transcendent order, wouldn't there be a dominant culture that was the right culture? Um, I do think that that's a legitimate criticism or concern about what it is that these conservative uh, principles are actually asking for. Um, but I, I do think that the way to reconcile those two is to say that the natural order manifests itself differently in different places, just like different uh, ecosystems have a different set of organisms and a different kind of terrain and different kinds of soils, uh, because all of those things, uh, there is a natural order, there, 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 is still, there are still scientific laws underlying what uh, makes one species survive and another one not, and what makes them adapt in certain ways, but in different environments they adapt differently. So the natural order is at sort of the highest level of generality, and then within specific places, within specific ecosystems, within specific nations, uh, in certain geographic areas, there's going to be diversity uh, even within that order. So natural order doesn't necessarily preclude 
that kind of cultural diversity. Number three, um, and this is, I think, probably the, the strongest, clearest uh, pointing towards what uh, political, economic, and social order should be. Conviction that civilized society requires orders and classes as against the notion of a classless society. With reason, conservatives have been called the party of order. If natural distinctions are faced among men, oligarchs fill the vacuum. And so what they're saying is that, you know, we, part of what makes human society work for humans is that there have to be orders and distinctions in classes, that we are naturally different from each other, that inequality is part of the transcendent order, um, not all people are created equal, and therefore trying to say that we should all be treated as uh, equal or placed in a relationship of equality towards each other is to upset the natural order. Um, where do we get these orders and classes? Where do we get these distinctions uh, that are going to be sort of the, uh, uh, the, the central point of what our, how our society is organized? We get them through traditional uh, practices, right? Um, if the world is organized in a way that men have more public power than women, and that that has been the way it's been for 5,000 years, that is a distinction that is, in the conservative view, is worthy of uh, admiring and protecting, because it wouldn't exist if it didn't actually serve human society. Now, the reverence for orders and classes, particularly for classes, is way easier to have when you're not when you're in a privileged position in whatever that class structure is. And so it's not too surprising that the people who are sort of the biggest advocates for uh, a uh, conservative social order are the ones who have a privileged place, right? Not to say there can't be female conservatives, but to be a male conservative in a way makes sense. Like, well, yeah, the, the, the way the, you know, I'm a white male and we have the most privilege and power in society, that is the natural order, that makes sense. It's going to be way easier not to criticize the natural order when your place in the so-called natural order is an absolutely privileged one. If you are at the bottom of the natural order, uh, you might say, well, yeah, you know, this gives stability and certainty and uh, predictability to the world, and those are all pretty good things, but it's all on my back, uh, and that it can't just be that this is all there is. We, we, we human beings should be able to remake and reshape the world to our wishes. We've done it to the national environment, right? That's the reason why we have the standard of living we have, is that we've taken what was given to us, and uh, you know, either by God or by, by evolution, by nature, and by geologic forces, and we've reshaped it in pretty radical ways. There's no reason we can't reshape society. Now, it's that, again, that reshaping impulse that conservatism is really uh, pushing against and saying, no, 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 don't reshape, accept. Uh, don't think that the order of things now is accidental, it's a natural order. Whatever your place is in it, accept it and make do with what you have, right? <clears throat> Number four, on now on page nine, um, the persuasion that freedom and property are closely linked. Separate property from private possessions. Oh, separate property from private possessions and Leviathan becomes master of all. Economic leveling they maintain is not economic progress. Um, Property distinctions really are central, and part of this is that property, even though capitalism is a relatively new economic order, property ownership and uh, the dominance of one group of property owners over another has been a perpetual feature of human society. Um, and the, whoever the property are, and in each different economic context, it's been a different group of people, but it's always been a smaller group, and the, the property have been the most socially and politically powerful. So conservatives actually see that that's actually an important link, that um, our freedom, and that means our ability to sort of not be oppressed uh, by our own desires possibly, by other people, is premised on the fact that the property order as it develops in the traditional distrib distribution and the traditional rules for holding and transferring property, they have a fundamentally beneficial effect on, it, on individuals. And again, that that's a very easy thing to say when you are among the privileged in whatever kind of property uh, regime there might happen to be. Number five, uh, faith in prescription and distrust of sophisters, calculators, and economists who would reconstruct society upon abstract designs. Custom 
convention, and old prescription are checks both upon man's anarchic impulse and upon the innovator's lust for power. And I think this, I starred this, number five and number six in my notes because I do think that this is kind of the core of the problem that conservatives have with liberalism, which is liberalism promises this kind of like reinvention of self and society. Um, society is a product of uh, a separate sovereign individuals, and so society can be remade. Um, society is, to a certain extent, a threat to individual sovereignty, and so society itself is always potentially under attack. Um, the, notice this part. Uh, custom convention and old prescription are checks, upon, uh, both, checks both upon man's anarchic impulse and upon the innovator's lust for power. There's an acknowledgement here that there are other dispositions that are part of human nature. There are other traits that we have. We have anarchic impulses to essentially follow no rules. And then we also have uh, the lust for control. The innovator's lust for power is really less, not so much lust for power over people, but lust for power over the natural uh, universe particularly, but also then over, over other people. Uh, these are impulses that conservatives find problematic and threatening. And so rather than cultivating innovation and uh, remaking, you know, making your own rules, uh, they see those impulses as problematic for human beings as opposed to beneficial. So once again, I've, I've said this a couple times, I think that uh, a big part of the difference between the, what we could call the liberal disposition and the conservative disposition is which of our human traits that are acknowledged by both groups of thinkers as part of our makeup, part of what we have, which set of traits should we be scared of and protect against, and which set of our traits should we be embracing and cultivating and privileging? Um, and convention, custom, and old prescription, which is really just three ways of saying tradition, uh, are going to be things that are going to protect us from our worst sides, right? What could be worse than our anarchic impulses? But there is an acknowledgement in that statement, and I think there is a conservative acknowledgement that human beings have these traits that we should be afraid of. We should be afraid of ourselves. Um, and liberalism is asking us to, instead of being afraid of ourselves, is essentially asking us from the conservative point of view to worship ourselves and say, we can be the maker and remaker of our own universe. We can, we can create new traditions at any time. We can recreate the social, economic, and political order. We can re recreate our own conception of the good. We can change our life. And uh, yes, you can. But that is not good for us. Okay, the final, um, the final uh, canon. Recognition that change may not be salutary reform. Hasty innovation may be a devouring conflagration rather than a torch of progress. Society must alter, for prudent change is the means of social preservation. <clears throat> I think this is an important thing. Prudent change um, and social preservation are two, are two key concepts in conservative thought. So it's not, as I said earlier, sort of sinking the, what the world is like in amber at this moment and saying this is how it has to always be and it has to be this way everywhere. But prudent change is different than change um, and that it uh, is the means of social preservation. A statesman must take providence into his calculation and a statesman's chief virtue according to Plato and Burke is prudence. So there's an acceptance that change and transformation is inevitable. It's actually part of the natural order. Um, while you know uh, the, the, these conservatives don't talk about evolution, and of course some people who are uh, you know who call themselves conservatives believe that evolution is a false doctrine and that uh, the world is created by and ordered by uh, some kind of deity, there is this acceptance of the notion of evolution and the notion that there is a reason to accept and embrace change, but change by itself, as a good in itself, is rejected. And the idea that um, change should be viewed suspiciously comes from this uh, acknowledgement that the way people are doing things, the, the, the kinds of practices that, have, that are around today, that have been around for generations, that reproduce themselves, why do they reproduce themselves generation after generation? They reproduce themselves not through some massive propaganda effort, but through essentially natural selection. They get reproduced and passed on because they work for people. And when someone comes along and promises a, a different thing, different change, excitement, like we have this exciting, we, oh yeah, that's, show me the shiny thing and I want the shiny thing. But that, that impulse, 
should be resisted in favor of looking at the way things have been and saying, well, there's a wisdom to the things that have been passed along all of these generations, not because of a massive propaganda effort by some set of rulers, but because they actually work. Uh, tradition and reverence for the social order that has developed and the stability that uh, sort of human society and conservative view tends towards and less disrupted by these individually, individually oriented uh, liberals, that there's worthiness in that and that you don't necessarily reject change, but you're suspicious of change. You don't necessarily block all innovation, but you are more prudent and cautious in embracing new ways of doing things. Partly because change can really be disruptive and it can mess with people's lives. Uh, so not just rushing to the next change and also not giving people this notion that you can rule yourself. Like that's what, that's what liberalism promises. You, the individual, you can rule yourself. You're capable of ruling yourself and you're gonna be allowed to rule yourself. To conservatives, that's, it's actually dangerous because there's a fundamental distrust in the common run of humanity that this capability can be exercised uh, successfully. That uh, people who have the power to shape and reshape their own lives are going to actually do that in a prudent uh, way that serves them and that serves society. What they're probably going to do is they're probably going to make all kinds of changes and screw things up and affect other people and undermine social order and unwittingly make other people's lives worse off. Uh, and so I, I think that the conservative disposition is really fundamentally a suspicion of wanting to remake the world but mostly it's fundamentally a distrust of allowing most people to rule themselves. We are not the kinds of beings, in the conservative viewpoint, who all of us can rule ourselves. And this is, gets back to the whole you know, orders and classes. There, there's inequality. There are people who are, right? And social orders and classes are necessary because we want people who have the uh, ability to weigh uh, evidence and to think of uh, important uh, projects and changes. We want those people to be able to be in charge. But why would you listen to people who don't have that level of skill uh, in making our plans? And why would you let those people run their own lives? You know, like you look at your kids and you're just like, oh, you know, one of you actually has your shit together. And so I'm going to just go ahead. You do, do what you want. Like you want to be an engineer. You want to be a physicist. You want to be an artist. Like, okay, you have the capacity. The other ones, you look and go, well, you know, if I let you guys run your lives, you're just going to end up being drug addicts and criminals. So I'm going to exercise authority over you. Um, now, I, I'm not really sure if that's a thing, that a, that a real example of what a conservative would think, but it, it's, it's a metaphor for the fact that different people are differently capacitied. That's a terrible word, capacitied. Are differently enabled, uh, have different uh, differential levels of skill. Some people are capable of exercising individual sovereignty, but most are not. And if we reverence a society, or excuse me, we create a society and reverence this form of individualism, what we're doing is essentially we're giving over to many people for whom it's inappropriate a, a tool that is really more dangerous, right? Um, don't give a running chainsaw to somebody who's reckless and afraid and easily spooked or easily distracted, right? Um, you don't give a running chainsaw to somebody unless you know that they have the capacity to take that. You don't even give a not running chainsaw to somebody because they can turn it on. It doesn't have the capacity to use that tool. Individual sovereignty is a tool that is inappropriate for most people, according to the conservative viewpoint. So liberalism is, uh, in a way, it's problematic, it's dangerous from the conservative perspective because it takes human beings away from uh, essentially their settled best use of themselves. It disrupts social forms uh, and uh, traditional cultural practices that have survived the test of time. It values individualism and innovation uh, in a way that is inappropriate to human society. Now, at base, fundamentally, underneath of this is this notion of human nature that is not as 
um, inspiring as the liberal notion of human nature. And uh, conservatives will, off, I would say, often refer to themselves as more as realists, that liberals are the, are the utopian dreamers who believe that human beings can be capable of exercising their own fat, rational faculties in a way that actually is good for them and good for uh, others around them. And conservatives are going to be realistic and say, seriously, do you think that most people can be trusted with this running chainsaw that is individual sovereignty? No, I don't think so. Let's, let's be realistic. Look at the world. Look at people around you. Is this a group that you would consider to be ready to run their own lives, shape, them own, shape their own selves, and remake uh, society in whatever image seems to them? No. We're, we're flighty. We are lazy. We have a narrow perspective. We are easily, too easily impassioned towards things which are destructive for us. Uh, the, so there, there's this pessimistic or suspicious conception of human capability and of what human nature is. But there's also this acceptance of inequality. Some people really are. Like some people are already toss me the running chainsaw. I'll catch it and I'll carve a bear out of this uh, out of this tree stump. Some people can do that, right? You you can't hand a running chainsaw to most people without them hurting themselves. Uh, but you can for some people you could toss them a running chainsaw and they're going to carve a bear. And that's part of the natural order, right? If you look around nature, you see, and this kind of gets back to the, to, the, to the proliferating forms, you'll see so many different forms that what you're seeing is inequality. And the liberals are mistakenly saying, well, no, underlying all of this inequality is a fundamental equality. And that equality, and it's, I think it's a, a, a decent critique of liberalism, that equality is an abstract concept that we, that we say, well, all humans are created equal. But if you actually just step back and look at human beings, you're like, I don't, where's the equality? I don't see any equality. What I see is I see a huge amount of inequality and I see a huge amount of diversity. So you're telling me that all of these people who have different abilities, different capacities, some of them can carve a bear out of a running chainsaw, some of them could actually barely tie their own shoes. Uh, like, where's the equality there? Uh, it's purely abstract and it's a dangerous abstraction. Uh, I think that in a way that's probably what the conservative uh, um, critique or problem with liberalism is. It's a set of dangerous, problematic abstractions that when you look at the real world, you see traditions that are time-tested. Now, they do need protecting, right? Just because they're time-tested doesn't mean they don't need protecting. They need protecting against the anarchic impulses, against this ruthless innovation, against this dangerous and problematic uh, doctrine of liberalism that's spreading uh, because it's appealing. It is very appealing. If you say to people, hey, you can run your own life. People are like, oh, I, can, I never thought of that before, but if you say so, that's what liberalism is saying that to everybody. You can run your own life. And it's saying it uh, willy-nilly to everybody. God, I hate that phrase, willy-nilly, but I just used it. It's saying that to everybody, regardless of, without any kind of analysis of whether that's appropriate to say to those people or not. Like, and, and that is fundamentally the, the uh, problem that conservatives have with, with liberal thought. All right, well, I, th this was a relatively fast lecture, and I don't need to draw it out just so that I fill whatever time we would be filling in the classroom. So uh, from uh, my dining room on day 53 of my self-quarantine, I am going to say that's my dance on conservatism. We'll talk about uh, a related set of ideas next time that is more like a political uh, doctrine, communitarianism.